Hey, welcome to session 15, part B. Okay, I'm going to start off with this is a problem that I have designed, and it turns out this is going to be on your midterm, on your second midterm. I've already put it on the second, or at least uh, almost surely, put it this way. Almost surely this will be uh, on your second midterm. Um, here is the question. Okay, it's like the one, the, the question I just designed, but it's, we put some numbers on this. Bria and Miguel are two children who want to watch television. They have three different channels from which to choose. Rhea's favorite, okay. Rhea's favorite is the Disney Channel. So her number one choice is the Disney Channel. Her benefits from getting to watch this channel are $30. That's how much she values it. Okay. Number two, her second and third favorites are the Food Network. Food Network number three is the Disney Channel. And the Food Network brings her benefits of 25. And the Disney Channel brings her benefits of 15. Okay. Miguel is the other child. And he ranks the Three channels in opposite. Whoa, wait, what did I do? Um, last one. There's Disney, uh, ESPN. Miguel ranks ESPN first, and he gets a benefit of twenty dollars if he gets to watch. ESPN, that's how much he prefers it. Uh, in other classes, economic, we call it the utility, if you like. Um, number two is Food Network. And he gets a benefit. If he gets to watch Food Network, he gets a benefit of 14. And number three is Disney Channel. And he gets a benefit of five. Okay, their parents are considering two rules. Rhea gets to decide, or two, Miguel gets to decide. Under the two rules, which channel will the children watch? This is a bit of a trick question, okay? Now, I think most people, if you haven't learned about the Coast Theorem, you're going to say, oh, well, this has got to be uh, Rhea gets to decide, Disney. Miguel gets to decide, ESPN, okay? But here's what I want you to notice, okay? Um, what is the efficient outcome? So what is, if you wanted to combine, to maximize the sum of their benefits, what would you choose? Notice Disney, the sum of their benefits is 35, 30 plus 5. Food Network, it's 25 plus 14, and that is 39. And uh, ESPN, uh, ESPN is 35. You know, I may change that so that 35 and 35 to equal each other. But regardless, keep it like the way it is for now. Um, but the Food Network uh, uh, brings more benefits, total benefits, than the other two. Okay, that's the key. Okay. If Rhea gets the side, if they choose rule one, so naturally Rhea would say, well, I'm going to pick Disney. Okay. Um, Miguel would be willing to say, um, look, uh, for, uh, $15, will you watch ESPN? Um, she might, she might be willing, that would make her indifferent. On the other hand, if he said, uh, look, um, for the Food Network, uh, I'm willing to pay, um, Let's see. How, um, I'm willing. I get an extra nine dollars out of benefit if we can switch from Disney. To, oh, wait, wait, wait. How? Yeah. If we can switch from uh, Disney to the Food Network, I get nine dollars worth more benefit. Okay. 
Rhea is willing to switch if she gets a payment of at least $5, okay? If Miguel offers her more than $5, they can come to a deal, say it's 7 Miguel may say something like, uh, look, look, I'll pay $7 if we can switch the Food Network. This would make Rhea better off and it would make Miguel better off. There's a way they can come to a deal where they will, even though Rhea gets to the side, Rhea will agree to switch after she gets that side payment from Miguel. So, uh, now, on the other hand, if they've decided the Food Network, there's no way to go to anything else. So it turns out if they're on the Food Network, Miguel says, if we want to go to ESPN, he's willing to pay at most $6, but Rhea needs to get at least 10 So Rhea, there's no way Rhea would accept any deal that Miguel is willing to pay. On the other hand, if it's on the Food Network, Rhea wants to switch to the Disney Network. Rhea is willing to pay at, at most 5 but to get Miguel to switch, you got to pay at least 9 There's no way um, there, that Rhea could offer a payment big enough. She would not be willing to. So when, if you, you, the, the only channel that they will agree to, when, it, that they will agree to and stick to the agreement without any uh, further negotiation would be the food channel. So the answer is under one, rule one is going to be the food network. And the same thing if instead Miguel gets to the side, the same thing is going to happen. Miguel, even though Miguel wants ESPN, there is a, a potential bargain where Rhea would be willing to pay t at, at most $10 to, to get him to switch. Miguel only needs 6 to get him to will. There's a deal that can be made. Same thing. Uh, they will come to an agreement to switch from ESPN to the Food Network. No matter which rule they decide, whether it's one or two, they will end up... Um, uh, watching the Food Network. Um, okay, so under the two rules, which channel will the children which watch? Uh, I guess I should, maybe I add some uh, uh, extra details of this. Uh, you might say something like under the Coase theorem, uh, we know if one has a property right, if one of the children has a property right, and that happens with rule one or rule two, uh, regardless of who gets that property rights, they will come to an efficient outcome. And they, so the efficient outcome is the food network. We said that's where the benefits, the sum of the benefits are maximized. So because, if you wanted to say, because of the Coase theorem, uh, they will both end up on the food network. Okay. Um, okay. And that would be the answer to, the, to this question. You would say under either rule, the food network is what the, would be the, the the channel that the two children would watch. Okay, so that is my extra question. Um, okay, next, um, number eleven. Okay, okay. Uh, historians often lament the destruction of the great herds of uh, bison uh, that roam the western prairies before. For the arrival of non-native hunters. Okay. Um, a why were so many people willing to shoot these animals and leave their meat and hide to rot? W wasn't this highly wasteful? Um, the answer to this uh, part A is uh, no one had property rights. Uh, this is part of the Coase theorem. When you haven't assigned property rights, you get problems, and the people who were willing to shoot at these bison from the train, okay? They didn't own the bison, and it's not clear they could even uh, go get the meat from, from that bison. So they don't care what happens to the bison. If an, uh, now, if instead a rancher had owned those bison and someone shooting from the train, that rancher is going to get mad and you're going to sue the people from the train and try to get law enforcement or, or, or somehow prevent the bison from being close enough to the train to get shot. There, there's a rancher who has a stake in that meat. The, a lot of those killings are going to pre prevent it. Okay, So that's the key to part A, is that um, it, no one owned the property rights uh, to those bison. Okay, Who bore the cost when a hunter shot a bison or buffalo from the window of a passing train? Well, it's the other people who... Um, enjoy seeing the, the bison, uh, also possibly the uh, potential people who may eat, eat the meat, okay? 
but they're dispersed and they don't own a property right and so there's uh, really no way to enforce this uh, uh, I'm going to switch instead of doing C next I'm going to go to D okay. what animal has replaced the buffalo on the western prairies why did the numerous vast herds of cattle that cover the country not suffer the fate of the buffalo okay so the key is that with cattle, just about every case I'm aware of, there's someone with each cow or bull that there's someone who owns that animal. There's a rancher who owns it. And you see this with lots of different industries. If someone, especially in the, um, the ranching industry, if someone owns the animals, they have an incentive to make the, to protect the herd and to expand it. Um, 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 through extra births of uh, calves in, in this case. And so you have this thriving uh, numbers of cattle because of the property rights. You don't with the bison because there were no property rights. Okay, number 11C said, was the near extinction of the buffalo an irreversible act or could we bring back these huge herds of buffalo back within a few years if the proper incentives existed? Okay, yeah, I think the authors are saying, yeah, if you just have some ranchers own uh, some bison. They have an incentive to make these uh, bison multiply through new births. They have an incentive to protect them to being shot from these random people sh shooting. Um, and a result that they would they would come back, especially if there's uh, a demand for the meat. If people wanted to start eating uh, these bison, okay. So that is uh, the answer to C. Okay, that was eleven. Uh, Um, a lot of these uh, you know, questions all have the same theme. Do we need laws to prevent cropland erosion? Does cropland erosion create negative externalities? Um, well, the, the key is that um, if someone owns the land, you, you know, the, they're the one that has been internalized. That problem has been internalized. The owner of the land is the one who suffers uh, the erosion. And if there's an owner to the land, it's no longer an externality. Uh, that person has incentives to set up different devices to prevent erosion. Um, um, how will farming practices called soil erosion, that cause soil er erosion affect the present value of farmland? Well, if someone if is a farmer and his soil is being eroded, that, that decreases his farmland. So that farmer has an incentive to, to prevent the erosion. Uh, on the other hand, it's public land, uh, something like that, then no one has an incentive, and that's why you often have more erosion on public land than you do on private land. How the owner of farmland wants to maximize present value of land, decide whether or not to adopt particular soil conservation measures. Um, well, he will use, if, if the cost of the erosion is worse than the cost of the, the measures to protect the erosion, uh, he, he will adopt those measures to prevent the erosion. Okay. Why will a tenant farmer ordinarily adopt fewer and less effective soil conservation techniques than an owner? Well, a tenant farmer doesn't own the land. A tenant farmer is just using the land for that short period of time to harvest whatever food, and then he or she is gone. He has no incentive to try to keep maintain that land, keep it the, the upkeep of the, the land so it's valuable for future farmers. So a tenant farmer has less incentive than the actual owner of the land. Okay, so that was C, 13 A, B, and C. Okay, um, 14. Um, See, uh, I can't quite. Okay. 14. Here's a multiple choice question for you to think about. The buildings and grounds at Ivy College are far more littered than the buildings and grounds at Ivyville Shopping Mall because, one, students are slobs by nature. Two, people use the Ivy uh, campus more than use the shopping mall. Three, customers at the shopping mall have less opportunity to litter. Blah, blah, blah. Four, customers at the mall have less incentives to deliver because they are proud to blah, blah, blah. These are five. There are people at the mall, but not on the uh, Ivy League 
college campus who expect to receive substantial financial benefits from keeping the buildings of the grounds litter free. I'd, I'd say it's five. The owner of the mall wants to keep that thing clean. Uh, otherwise, he, he cannot get he or she cannot get as many rents uh, from future owners and present owners of, of different stores. So that person has an incentive. Now you say, what about the Ivy League College campus? Well, it's hard to say who owns it. Often these things are, are um, run by endowments and we students, we professors, it really does it doesn't affect our salary or our tuition much if the campus has litter on it. Uh, now there are people who do have an incentives and in, in a sense, even a, a nonprofit college, in a sense it's owned by the board of trustees and the board of trustees, they're supposed to be picked so that they have an incentive to maintain the reputation and the value of the college. Um, they pick a president who supposedly has those same incentives in mind. The president picks deans. And a story, I can tell you, I'm, I'm walking along with uh, a friend of mine who became an associate dean. And um, uh, this is when I used to teach at the Stanford Business School. We're walking along, all of a sudden he reached down to pick up some trash. And he said, you know, I've learned that's what you do when you're a dean. <laughs> you just pick up trash. And his point was that all of a sudden, when he was a professor, he really didn't have that as much interest in getting lots of students to apply and lots of students to get their tuition money. He got paid regardless. But all of a sudden, when he became a dean, all of a sudden his job uh, his job performance is partly based upon how many students he can get to come uh, to Stanford Business School. And so once he's a dean, he says, yeah, this is what we do. We pick up trash. <laughs> and he had actually quit being a dean. He was now back to being a regular professor. And he said, yeah, I don't have the incentive now that I'm just a regular professor. But it turns out I got into the habit of it when I was the dean. And now I still pick up the trash. Um, okay. So that is the difference between a mall owner and a college university, a nonprofit or a, a government building. When someone owns the, the, the property, they have a more incentive to, to upkeep it um, and keep it litter free. Okay, so that was part B. I think I'm going to end there, and I'll see you in part C.